35 years of Castlevania. That's how long this great series has been around. And now that I'm making content on YouTube with a huge emphasis on Castlevania, I figured I should do something special for its anniversary this year. So today, I'll be talking about every single playable Castlevania character throughout the series and all of their playable appearances and games they were in. Before we start, I need to lay down a few rules. I'm only going to be highlighting their playable appearances, so as an example, my main man Alucard is an assist trophy in Smash Brothers, but he's not playable. So for instances like that, I won't be counting it. This rule is also going to extend to special abilities like Greatest 5 or assists in Grimoire. Yes, you're using attacks with Richter and Jonathan for example, but you aren't actually playing as them. That's what I mean. I'll be focusing on ones that originated in Castlevania for the most part, so I won't count characters like Kokoro Belmont or Sophia Belmont. But if you're interested in learning about characters like that, I'd recommend checking out my obscure Belmont video. I'm focusing on the mainline series and its specific spin-offs, so no Lords of Shadow today, but for those who are curious, this is every playable character in that continuity. Additionally, I won't be counting the Pachinko games because they're Pachinko games, and I won't be talking about characters from cancelled games that aren't relevant to the character, like for example, Moonlight Rhapsody because that game, oh, that, that shit is done, whoa. Okay, that's about it. Let's get started. Here comes a new challenger! Leon Belmont was introduced in Castlevania Lament of Innocence on the PS2 in 2003 and is canonically the first member of the Belmont clan we play as in the lore. The game was made as an origin story for this series, so he's extremely important, being the first to use and create the legendary vampire killer whip and begin the events of the long war against Dracula throughout the games. Despite how much narrative impact Leon's journey gave to the games, Lament of Innocence is surprisingly his only playable role. This being a 3D Castlevania game, he plays Dracula drastically different to his descendants, but I think this worked out in his favor because of how fleshed out the combat is. It's not a stretch to classify the gameplay as something in the character action genre, with obvious inspirations to DMC and its combat, but it has a lot to differentiate itself to it, like the really well implemented sub weapons and supers. Leon's a great character in this underrated game that I definitely recommend looking into if you're interested. A great first Belmont to begin the long battle against the forces of darkness. Nobody blink! Sonia Belmont might be a weird placement here, but that's because because she's similarly as important to Leon, being a Belmont created to have an origin story for the narrative in the series. She was playable first and only in Castlevania Legends on the Game Boy in 1997. I talked about her a bit in my obscure Belmont video, where in that I went over how she was Thanos snapped out of the timeline, unfortunately getting rid of her chances to be a part of the series' future. It's understandable given the context of the events of the game, but it sucks because she's a character that now has a pretty big following. They didn't do you justice, Sonya. It's worth noting her second playable appearance would have been in the cancelled Sega Dreamcast game, Castlevania Resurrection, where she would have starred with her descendant from the future, Victor Belmont. It's showtime! Trevor Belmont has become one of the most popular characters because of the animated series, but rightfully so, as he's been a part of the franchise since almost the beginning, introducing Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse on the NES. In the lore, he's the first Belmont to actually defeat Dracula. Because of this, their clan becomes famous, with this story passed down as legend throughout the years. Years. Castlevania 3 Trevor is when they went back to Simon's playstyle in the first game. Very straightforward, with a few tweaks, but ultimately they play pretty much the same. That's not a bad thing. The classic Vania's traditional Belmont playstyle might take some getting used to, but the level design is always designed around it. Well, sometimes. Trevor would make another playable appearance as a bonus character in Curse of Darkness, and finally in the Castlevania fighting game, Judgment on the Wii, where him and many others that we'll get to would receive a controversial redesign. One of the cool Coolest characters in the series, I'm glad he's getting the recognition he deserves, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him show up in the games again in the near future. Let's party! Christopher Belmont was introduced in Castlevania The Adventure on Game Boy, and as I've said previously on this channel, he's definitely not the most well-known or appreciated Belmont. The Adventure plays slower compared to the other games in the classic Vania style. Despite this, Christopher still has some unique attributes, like when the whip is fully upgraded, he has a shooting fireball that's actually incredibly useful if you can hold on to it. He would make another playable appearance in his direct sequel, Castlevania 2, Belmont's Revenge, where a lot about the first game would be addressed like the slow movement and difficulty. Castlevania 
Castlevania The Adventure would actually be remade years later for the Wii Shop channel in 2009, and hell dude, it's a great remake. If only there was an official way to play it today, as now that the Wii Shop channel is shut down, it currently only exists on the Wiis that got it at the time and emulation. I can't believe my eyes! Simon Belmont might just be the most popular character in the franchise, as he's made so many appearances since his debut with the original Castlevania in 1986. It's interesting too, because compared to where the story and games of Castlevania would go, Simon's not the most important in its lore or anything like that. He's just a vampire hunter, doing his duty to slay Dracula and save the world. As I talked about with Trevor, Simon would establish the Belmont playstyle, using thoughtful limitations in its controls to lend to character expression with how you approach enemies and obstacles to its fullest, complemented by the level design. Unless you have the holy water. That shit. That shit is crazy. More on that later. Simon would get a direct follow-up with Simon's Quest on the NES and pretty much the first Metroidvania game in the series, where as a lot of you know, many Castlevania tropes would be established. His original adventure would be remade so many times after this throughout the years, such as in Haunted Castle, Vampire Killer, Super Castlevania 4, and Castlevania Chronicles. Simon wouldn't even be close to done with these playable appearances, however. He would be in harmony of dissonance using the iconic Konami code for the game's boss rush mode, he would be in the roster of Castlevania Judgment where he looks exactly like a buff light Yagami, he would appear as his iconic NES sprite once again in Harmony of Despair, where his moveset would be very faithfully adapted to the game's playstyle, and finally, he is currently playable in Grimoire of Souls where he would return to his barbarian NES look, with his moveset receiving an overall to fit the game. As far as playable appearances outside of Castlevania, there's so many as well. He would appear as a fighter in Dream Mix TV World Fighters, that's just incredible, Konami's new international track and field on the DS, where he would be a participant in these sports minigames, Super Bomberman R and Super Bomberman R Online, where Simon would be a playable Bomberman in these games, and finally, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, a well-deserved placement in the game's roster, looking at Simon's legacy building history. Juste Belmont is Simon's direct grandson, and his only playable appearance would be in the game he was introduced in, Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance, released on the GBA in 2002. Juste is a really interesting Belmont in both the story and gameplay. Minor spoilers for Harmony of Dissonance, but he's one of the few Belmonts who doesn't really defeat Dracula in the traditional sense. Not a bad thing, I mean, Leon didn't either, and I'm sure both of them could have given the opportunity, but it's something interesting to keep in mind when discussing him. It's a Metroidvania game starring a Belmont, so Juicy's playstyle lends heavily to infinite super cool dashes, with emphasis on whip combat to show this. There's also a lot of importance on the use of magic, which I think definitely makes Juice unique as he might be the strongest magic Belmont user, if that makes sense. He's not the most popular canon Belmont, in fact, I think he might be the least popular, but he's still a pretty cool character, and I think the simple but memorable narrative in his game makes him more appealing as a character for those of you who played it. I've never seen a battle like this! Richter Belmont was introduced in Castlevania Rondo of Blood on the PC Engine in 1993, and with this, he would become one of the most iconic characters in the series. In his story, he would start as another Belmont doing his duty to stop Dracula and save his love interest. However, the roles would reverse in Rondo's direct sequel, Symphony of the Night, where he would act as Lord of the Castle. The events of that game would reveal Richter as being manipulated and controlled by the Dark Priest Shaft, where he would then after relinquish his family heirloom to his distant relatives, the Morris Clan, temporarily causing the Belmont Clan to stop their long fight against Dracula until the foretold year of 1999. Although Richter's ultimate fate is still unknown, his playable appearances in both Rondo of Blood and Symphony of the Night would be revolutionary revolutionary for the series, his 2D outing arguably mastering the classic Vania style, and his Metroidvania appearance building upon the established moveset, creating one of the most badass playable characters in the franchise. Also, he's OP as hell. Richter being so vital to the history of Castlevania in both real life impact and the narrative, he would continue to make many more playable appearances. His original story would be remade for the SNES in Dracula X, and a full 3D graphic remake years later on the PSP in Dracula X Chronicles. He would be playable in the spin-off game Puzzle Encore of the Night, and would return in full force with her fine movesets in Portrait of Ruin, and finally in Harmony of Despair. For non-Castlevania playable appearances, he would appear as a bomber in Super Bomberman R online, he would appear as a character for the Vampire Hunter class in the arcade game Eternal Nights 2, and arguably have one of his most important in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate alongside his ancestor Simon, well deserved for one of the most loved characters in the series. Triumph or die! 
Julius Belmont is the last member of the Belmont clan we know of in canon, with his first playable appearance being in his debut game, Arya of Sar on the GBA in 2003. Julius would be the one to finally defeat Dracula once and for all in the events of the Demon Castle War of 1999, and would continue fighting the forces of darkness years after this, becoming the oldest Belmont to still be active in battle. In Arya of Sorrow, Julius is a bonus playable character unlocked after beating the game, with his playstyle being similar to Richter's and Juste. Unlike them, he can switch his sub-weapons at will, with lots of unique attributes to him, like his teleport and iconic version of Grand Cross. Julius returns to the game's direct sequel, Dawn of Sorrow, where his moveset would say mostly the same but adjusted to be balanced with his two other companions in that mode, and finally in Harmony of Despair where he would arrive as DLC. He's crazy as hell in that mode if you know what you're doing. Although these games are his only playable appearances, he's made a huge impact across the games, definitely become a fan favorite over the years, and my personal favorite Belmont. What a terrible Fighter. Last and certainly least of the Belmonts, Desmond from Castlevania Order of Shadows on... <sighs> this. While I've never played Order of Shadows myself, I'm not really motivated to because it just doesn't look like something I'd enjoy. Like, at all. This was his only playable appearance, and the game was literally made to not be in Castlevania's continuity, so damn, they did you dirty, Desmond. Like I said in my obscure Belmont video, I would love to see him show up in the future as a reference or callback, but yeah, damn. Rest in peace, Desmond. That was only one and up. John Morris would be one of the two playable characters in Castlevania Bloodlines in 1994 for the Sega Genesis Mega Drive. This is his only playable appearance, being the introduction of the Morris clan, which would later be woven into the lore as distant relatives of the Belmonts. John plays very similarly to them, but there's a few things in Bloodlines that differentiate him. He can hook onto walls and swing similar to Simon in Castlevania 4, and he has access to unique sub-weapons never seen in the games before, like the Battle Axe, Crystal Blade Boomerang, and the powerful magic orb. Although John wouldn't be playable again, his legacy would live on in his son. Perfect! Jonathan Morris is the son of John Morris and was introduced in Castlevania Portrait of Ruin on the DS in 2006. The game is a sequel to Bloodlines, having some of the same characters and elements while still following the journey of the Morris clan. Jonathan himself doesn't play much of anything like his dad, mostly due to his game being in the Metroidvania genre, but this definitely works out in its favor. He can master many different weapons, level up his sub weapons with enough use, and through side quests even learn techniques using fighting game inputs that apply to lots of different situations. This would be even further explored in his playstyle through Harmony of Despair, where he would retain most of what he had in Portrait of Ruin, but only being able to use the Vampire Killer while also still being able to unlock martial art commands. One of the most fleshed out Castlevania characters in my opinion, but he definitely wouldn't have gotten far without his partner. Face it straight! Charlotte Allen is his second main playable character in Portrait of Ruin, and is partnered with Jonathan as a duo in that game. They're childhood friends and go through the game together, with her acting as a powerful magic user in her gameplay. She's pretty much the opposite of Jonathan when it comes to combat, but this is good because it lends to a different approach to enemies and obstacles with her, and when they work together, it lends very well to the gameplay if you play it smart. Like Jonathan, she would also be in Harmony of Despair, with her moveset being updated and upgraded to fit that game, and currently she's playable in Grim War of Souls where I think she's probably the most faithful recreation of the character's playstyle. You can't give it up! Literally just watch this video, he's one of my favorite Castlevania characters, I go super in depth about his entire history there. Double KO! With Stella and Loretta, I didn't talk about their gameplay in the Lacard video, so I'll do that now. But if you're interested about the lore side, definitely check it out. You can unlock Sisters mode after getting the true ending of Portrait of Ruin, and one of the coolest things about it is, it's pretty much a prequel to the main game. It's implemented simply but it's really effective, especially that ending. Sisters Mode has a bad stigma about in the community, that being because it uses the DS touchscreen to control, and I understand, definitely, but man, I'd be lying if I said it's not fun to use them. They're super powerful, Stella dealing big damage slowly, and Loretta dealing small damage really quickly. You're using the DS stylus to control their attacks, but the mode is still pretty fun. I enjoyed my time with it, I'll defend it. This was their only playable appearance, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them come back in some form. Definitely a lot they could still do with them. You have missed some God! 
Cypher Belnadas was introduced as one of the four playable protagonists of Castlevania 3 alongside Trevor. During the game she wears a hood to conceal her identity as a woman, until she reveals herself to Trevor at the end of Dracula's Curse. She's super powerful, pretty much establishing the mage style we would see with characters like Charlotte. Weak physical attacks, but godly life-saving magic, if you have enough hearts, of course. Cypher would also be playable in Judgment, where her story in that game acts as a prequel to Castlevania 3 sometime before Dracula's wife died. Although these are her only playable roles, she's obviously gained lots of well-deserved attention thanks to the animated series. But of course, her legacy would not end here. Get ready, fighters! Yoko Bolnadas is the far-ahead future descendant of Saifa, introduced in Aria of Sorrow but first made playable in Dawn of Sorrow alongside Julius and Alucard as a homage to Castlevania 3. Yoko continues the magic style of weak physical attacks and godly magic attacks like her ancestor, but her magic is totally new. She has a situational fire blast, electric balls that track the enemy, and a super powerful wide range ice shard attack. She would retain her moveset in Harmony of Despair, while seemingly getting all of these moves buffed and adjusted to getting leveled up over time. You've made Saifa proud, Yoko. The world's waiting for ya! Grant- Dunasty? How do you pronounce that last name? He's the third playable protagonist in Castlevania 3 alongside Trevor and Saifa. He's a fast, quick character that can angle his jump that was unheard of in the classic videos, and he can climb onto walls. He's a small pirate captain according to the American Instruction Manual that's really fun to use, especially because he plays so differently compared to any other Castlevania character. He would make his final playable appearance in Judgment, where he... oh, damn, what did they do to you, man? Despite him looking like a messed up mummy, his Judgment story takes place sometime after Dracula's curse where we find out he devoted himself to rebuilding the towns and cities caused by Dracula's destruction. His interaction with Saifa is just incredible. He becomes known as the hero who rebuilt Wallachia, finally putting some well-deserved respect on Grant's name. It all depends on your skill! Hector was introduced in Castlevania Curse of Darkness on the PS2 in 2005, with the game's story being a direct sequel to Castlevania 3, Dracula's Curse. The game deals with Hector, a devil forge master, on a revenge quest against Isaac over the death of his wife and maybe stopping Dracula's curse over the land along the way. This is his only playable appearance, being the second 3D Castlevania on the PS2 following up Lament of Innocence. As such, this game has a lot of the same elements but with so much being different in its gameplay, like the emphasis on combos, weapon variety, and Pokemon. The events of Curse of Darkness are pretty self-contained but it's a cool follow-up to Castlevania 3 and definitely an underrated game in the series. Hey, come on, stand up! Maria Renard was introduced in Castlevania Rondo of Blood as a second optional playable character alongside Richter. She has distant blood ties to the Belmonts, and as we see over the course of her journey, she becomes a powerful vampire hunter, assisting them in fighting the forces of darkness. In Rondo, she's extremely powerful, especially compared to Richter in gameplay, utilizing control over animals and the four celestial beasts in combat. She would be made playable in the Sega Saturn version of Symphony of the Night, where she's older and knows martial arts. She would be made playable in many other games after this, such as in the Dracula X Chronicles, Puzzle Encore, Portrait of Ruin alongside Richter in a callback to their first adventure, and Judgment where she would be obsessed over boobs. That's not a joke. The younger version of herself from Rhonda would be made playable way more than her older version, which is interesting, but this is evident in her multiplayer appearances like Harmony of Despair and Grimoire of Souls. She's definitely one of the most important characters in the series. On an unrelated note, I'm curious how she's going to be adapted to the animated series with Richter. Go for it, man! One of my favorite video game characters of all time, Alucard, would be introduced in Castlevania 3 alongside Trevor, Sypha, and Grant forming the original teammate to stop Dracula. In Dracula's Curse, he plays differently compared to his companions, having a fireball spread attack and the ability to turn into a bat. His importance to the franchise would really be made with his starring role in Symphony of the Night, where he would receive a drastic makeover and defining mechanics made to help establish the subgenre that is Metroidvania. The son of Dracula has made many other playable appearances in the games, such as in Puzzle Encore, Dawn of Sorrow to complete the Castlevania 3 homage with Yoko and Julius, Harmony of Despair, and Grimoire of Souls. For non-related Castlevania games, he's playable in Super Bomberman R and Super Bomberman R Online. However, another version of Alucard is just as important to highlight. That 
catching up! Kid Dracula was made as a parody spin-off game in the series starring what's heavily implied to be a version of Alucard. It's a light-hearted platformer that was extremely rare for the longest time, until its re-release on the Castlevania Anniversary Collection in 2019. There would be a Game Boy version made with some adjustments to fit onto the console, and several cameos of the titular character across many games. His only other playable appearance I could find is as a fighter in the Bullet Help type game, also published by Konami, Paradis. Dracula himself is the main antagonist of the series, and as a result he's pretty much in almost every single game as a boss character. Despite this, Dracula would only be playable in Judgment, where his redesign is somewhat fine for once. Oh, also Castlevania Puzzle Encore. This is understandable, but it's a technicality, as Dracula's soul would be reincarnated after the events of the Demon Castle War, bringing us... That was the best fight I ever saw! Soma Cruz is the reincarnation of Dracula, starring in Castlevania Aria of Sorrow. He utilizes the power of dominance, the ability to steal the souls of monsters and use their powers for himself. Although he has Dracula's soul, he's still his own person, and through the events of the game learns to suppress the dark powers within him. Soma would be dragged back into the conflict in Dawn of Sorrow, but even after this, dark powers would still tempt him time and time again throughout his life. In Harmony of Despair, Soma's playstyle would be refined, becoming one of the most versatile characters in the series, having so many demon souls and weapons at his disposal to suit all almost any playstyle. He was seemingly planned to be playable in Grim War, but at the time of recording this hasn't happened yet, although it's pretty much a matter of time. For non-Castlevania games, he was recently added as a bomber in Super Bomberman R Online. Awesome. One of the coolest Castlevania characters for sure, we'll definitely be seeing his adventure continue in Grim War sometime in the future. Death, similar to Dracula, is one of the main antagonists and is almost in every single game. If your Castlevania doesn't have death in it, you're doing something wrong. Like Dracula, he's prominent all throughout the series, but would only be playable in Castlevania Judgment. Interesting. Oh, also Castlevania Puzzle Encore. Not a playable appearance, but for those of you interested in Death story explored more in the series, I'd recommend watching my Rooked Anza of the Gods Abyss video, where he's a huge part in that story. Yeah! Carmilla is another one of Dracula's iconic subordinates, and recently she's become extremely popular because of her role in the animated series. While she's a recurring boss in the games, just like Dracula and Death, she would only be playable in Castlevania Judgment. Um, I don't even know if I need to talk about a redesign in it. Can you march the way to glory? Rounding off the Castlevania Judgment baddies is Golem. This would be his first and only role. A super interesting pick for the game's roster. I wonder why they chose him. Something interesting to note, his Judgment design is apparently supposed to be a mixture of the reoccurring enemy golems and Frankenstein's monster. Time over! Aeon is an original character made for Castlevania Judgment, and acts as a sort of all-seeing omnipresent guide through the game's arcade modes. Not much is known about him, but there are a few interesting details. He's part of some kind of time-watching organization, and it's implied he might be immortal? Maybe. He brings Castlevania characters from all over the timeline and other universes to face the Time Reaper, a creature similar to death from 10,000 years in the future. One character he brings from another universe is from the Castlevania 64 games, with the first one starring... Guys. Reinhard Schneider is the protagonist of the first three-dimensional Castlevania game released on the Nintendo 64 in 1999. Despite his different last name, Reinhardt is still very much a Belmont, and still acts as one in his quest to stop Dracula. Castlevania on the N64 takes some really interesting liberties in both story and gameplay, but Reinhardt's story specifically keeps things decently traditional, with a few twists and turns along the way. As for the gameplay, it's always a hot topic when discussing it, but it would be heavily improved upon in the game's sequel slash prequel slash remaster Legacy of Darkness. Legacy of Darkness would remix and master the two original campaigns of Castlevania 64, bringing us an arguably better experience all around. It would even give Reinhardt a badass redesign. The Castlevania 64 games aren't canon to the main timeline, but they are still really cool and worth checking out. If you're interested in trying them, I'd recommend going straight to Legacy of Darkness, as it's pretty much a deluxe super version of Castlevania 64, with all of its content and much more. Carrie Fernandez is the second playable character in Castlevania 64 alongside Reinhardt. Their campaigns are sort of interchangeable, but there are some differences in them, like interactions in story and gameplay. Her story is drastically different at certain points, even having unique goals, scenarios, and good and bad endings that really justify replaying them. Even in gameplay, she plays completely different to Reinhardt, now adopting a magic playstyle rather than a whip wielding one, and it's arguably a lot more difficult because of it. Like Reinhardt, her campaign would be remixed and mastered in 
Legacy of Darkness, and she would also receive a really cool redesign. An interesting character, I haven't played her campaign myself, but researching it, I'm surprised how much they changed in her story to make it unique. Sharpen your fangs! Cornell is the protagonist of Legacy of Darkness, which would come out after Castlevania 64, 11 months later that same year in 1999. It really seemed like they were trying to address most of the problems Castlevania 64 had, getting rid of bugs and glitches while adding more content like Cornell's campaign, which actually acts as a prequel to Reinhardt and Carrie's adventures. He's one of the most unique characters in the series. For example, he has a completely new playstyle with the ability to turn into a powerful werewolf, shooting claw beams, and just straight up slashing opponents. His new story is interesting as well, now taking center stage in this game, giving us context to previous story beats, but still being self-contained enough to be enjoyed on its own. In Legacy of Darkness, his story is actually required to unlock the other campaigns. Surprisingly, this isn't Cornell's only playable appearance, as he would return for the roster of Judgment, where, like some of the others, his arcade mode would act as a prequel to the events of his game. Really awesome character. I actually enjoyed his story a lot, and even if he's not canon, I still think he lends a lot to Castlevania with how much new stuff the developers did with him. That's great! Super! Excellent. Henry Old Ray is introduced during Cornell's campaign as a little kid where you have to save him. His dad became a vampire thanks to Dracula's subordinates, and his mom seemingly tormented by him, forcing her to tell Henry to run away as far as he can. Cornell not only defeated the vampire dad, but saved Henry, and after the events of the game, they become a new family with Cornell and his adopted sister, Ada. Together, the three are able to live a normal life. However, eight years later, Dracula is reborn. His forces kidnap six children, prompting an old older Henry that is now a knight of the church to save the kids during the events of Reinhardt and Carrie's adventures. Henry's campaign acts as a sort of minigame, being able to explore the world of Legacy of Darkness a lot more openly than possible with the other characters. His cutscenes are brief and there's not much to go off of with new developments, but the mode is still pretty interesting. You did a great job! Street Fighter. Nathan Graves is the protagonist of Castlevania Circle of the Moon, released on the GBA in 2001. This game would be the first Metroidvania to follow up the critically acclaimed Symphony of the Night, but Iga and his team wouldn't be involved in it, and as such there's a lot of really different stuff. For example, there's a big emphasis on the card system, which Nathan can use to mix and match for a lot of different abilities with different combinations. The story is seemingly a follow-up to Bloodlines, and it does some interesting things like the rivalry between Nathan and Hugh, but it plays a pretty safe for the most part. It's an enjoyable game, and Nathan as a character I found to be interesting but not compared to other Castlevania characters. Circle of the Moon would be Thanos snap from the timeline, and as such this would be Nathan's only playable appearance. Still an interesting character, I really like how they're using him as the poster boy for the advanced collection. His design is super appealing. You Shinoa is the protagonist of Castlevania Order of Ecclesia, released on the DS in 2008, and she's one of the best characters in the series. Sorry, that's a fact, not an opinion. In her game, she goes through an entire arc and a story that I won't spoil because I found it to be more enjoyable going into it blind. The story is simple, but it's elevated because of how well its ideas and concepts are conveyed in its narrative, and it's one that stuck with me because of how effective it was. Shinoa herself is a great character to control, having mastery over a lot of weapons you can use through the game, and having having a similar ability to Soma, absorbing powers of enemies and using them for yourself. She would be playable in the roster of Castlevania Judgment, and fun fact, you can unlock her straight away by using the DS Wii connection where you link your copy of Order of Ecclesia to Judgment. I always found the connectivity between the two games interesting, reminds me of the DS era of Pokemon. She would return in Harmony of Despair, and finally, currently in Grim War of Souls. Outside of Castlevania, she would be playable alongside Richter in Eternal Nights 2. If you take away anything from this video, it's to go play Order of Ecclesia. Select your fighting style! Albus is the second playable character in Order of Ecclesia, and is unlocked after you beat the true ending of Shinoa's story. Move over, Henry. We have another gun wielder in Castlevania, and he's really fun to play. Like Richter, as his second playable character, he's super powerful once you get the hang of him, and his playstyle is of course drastically different to Shinoa's. There's no story while playing him, and this is unfortunately his only playable appearance. It's weird, I feel like he would have been a perfect character for Harmony of Despair, but it's cool to see him as an assist in Grimoire of Souls, where him and Shinoa can a bit more development at least. If Harmony of Despair ever gets a re-release, I hope to see Albus as a new playable character. You proved yourself! 
Maxim is the second bonus playable character in Harmony of Dissonance alongside Juste. You can unlock him after getting the good ending of the game, and like a lot of the bonus characters, his playthrough doesn't have a story. Being a ninja, he's super fast with most all of his moves focusing on speed. He has traversal abilities out of the gate like his triple jump and this. Damn, this is crazy. This is his only playable appearance, but something interesting to note is you can get Maxim's sword in Portrait of Ruin. The Stellar Sword can be equipped by Jonathan Morris and is maybe the strongest sword type weapon in that game. Awesome. I guess Maxim chopped it during Harmony of Dissonance or something. But damn, Jonathan got his hands on a lot of legendary weapons in Castlevania. Anyway, a great bonus playable character, but Castlevania would have a lot more of them throughout the years. Select your character! Joachim Armster, I think I pronounced that correctly, is a bonus playable character in Lament of Innocence and is unlocked after beating the game with Leon. He was definitely a strange choice for an alternate playstyle, seeing as he just has one boss fight in the main story, but I think they made him work pretty well. His quote unquote story in this mode reminded me a little of Virgil's in Devil May Cry 4, having a unique end screen as a reward for going through the game with him. In the main story, Joachim is imprisoned in the dungeon because he tried to usurp Walter from his throne and fails. He's slain by Leon, but in this mode, once you beat it, you get a unique scene of him on the throne. I don't know, I thought that was pretty interesting. His gameplay is simple, but requires you to be more in tune to enemy patterns, making it a bit harder for sure. A cool but strange choice for a playable character, but Lament of Innocence would go even stranger. Congratulations! Pumpkin is the last bonus character in Lament of Innocence and is unlocked after beating the game with Joachim. I still don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I didn't even know he was a thing before researching this video, so I've never played his mode, but he's apparently supposed to be a glass cannon. Hitting super hard, but if he gets hit himself, it's not gonna play out so well. Something interesting to note, Pumpkin returns as one of Hector's Pokemon monsters in Curse of Darkness. Hey, there's somebody who can stop this fighting machine! The Axe Armor is one of the most iconic Castlevania enemies, and is pretty much in every game, I think, but in Symphony of the Night you're able to wear its armor. Using the gravity boots to annoy the librarian a bunch of times, he'll drop the Axe Lord armor, and using it will completely change how you play the game. Fun fact, you can also get the Axe Armor right at the beginning, after beating the game and creating a new file with the name Axe Armor. It's just Alucard wearing it and it's mostly just for jokes, but it's kind of overpowered. You can legitimately fight all the bosses with it. Playable Axe Armor would return, this time as a full-fledged mode in Portrait of Ruin after defeating 1,000 of them. You can go through the entire game with it, now having a super jump and, of course, an Axe sub weapon. Axe Armor would sort of return in Harmony of Despair, where if someone is using a DLC character you don't have, they'll show up as an Axe Armor. The fan-made Unity port would just make Axe Armor playable, as it probably should be. Something worth highlighting, in Bloodstained, Shovel Knight would take on the mantle of Axe Armor, being a regular enemy where you can acquire its armor and become them. But in Bloodstained, it's Shovel Knight. That's pretty awesome. It's not the end! Might as well get this out of the way before the last one. Castlevania Puzzle Encore of the Night released on mobile phones in 2010, and would have a good amount of playable characters in its arcade mode. Alucard, Maria, Richter, Dracula, and Death as I've already mentioned. But there would be three more from Symphony of the Night. The Succubus, Shaft, and Master Librarian. The game was removed years ago, so it's difficult to play firsthand today, but if I ever get my hands on it, you can bet I'll be making a video covering it. Getsu Fuma is from the game Getsu Fuma Den, and would be a guest playable character in Castlevania Harmony of Despair as DLC. He would come with a stage representing a lot of his levels and bosses from his game, and of course it came with incredible remix themes. He acts similarly to Simon, being an 8-bit warrior but it definitely lends to the charm of the characters, especially because at the time of Harmony of Despair, the Getsu Fuma Den series would only be the one Japanese exclusive game. That is, until recently of course. The game looks dope, I haven't played it myself yet but I look forward to picking it up. Alright, that's every single playable character in the Castlevania series as of 2021. I searched every corner of Castlevania I could find, but I'm partly human, so I apologize if I missed anything. I'll hurt your comment if you can find something I missed, but I'm pretty confident I got most everything. Let's keep the discussion going, but seriously, thank you guys so much for watching. Happy 35th anniversary to Castlevania. I don't know if there's gonna be 35 more because of how unpredictable modern day Konami can be, but nevertheless, happy anniversary to this wonderful series. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like and subscribing, but as per usual, I just hope you got something out of your time here. Okay guys, as a great man once said, take care of yourselves, and of course, as usual, have yourself a damn good one. Take care guys.
Hang on, sweetheart. 